right, so today uh, we'll end up focusing a lot on this problem called independent set. Uh, really, the chapter is about a couple other problems, graph problems too, uh, similar to independent set that you should probably be aware of. But uh, when I was planning the time for the lecture, I think we'll end up focusing on this problem in particular. All right, so independent set. Let me uh, just quick rewind what we've been doing because I think this is relatively new for many more of you uh, than the earlier parts of the class. We've been looking at problems that are sometimes hard, starting with Boolean sat. Boolean sat is hard in the sense that we don't have a polynomial time algorithm for it. Although, and we would of course like to find one. And we start doing these, these funny things where, uh, okay, I can't figure out an algorithm for Boolean sat. I look at some special case like uh, CNS sat, you know, where it's kind of flat. And I find I don't have an algorithm for that too, but I can show there's an algorithm for CNS sat if and only if there's an algorithm for more general Boolean sat, which is something. And we did that for other variations like circuit sat, three sat, stuff like that. Those were all kind of related to sat. We did two, two sat and max two sat. There the punchline was that two sat's actually quite easy. And max two sat is just as hard as the rest. And the only difference is the word max. Then we start looking at problems that don't look like sat, but maybe have funny connections. That started with subset sum. It turns out the subset sum could be used to solve sat because the bits of, the, of a large number can actually encode quite a bit of information. Maybe an even bigger stretch in numbers was graph problems. So something like trying to find the longest path in the graph or deciding if there's a Hamiltonian path. In a DAG, you can solve this problem. You can solve it quite fast, in fact. You can do a lot of stuff in DAGs as you guys will explore in the homework. But in, in both directed and undirected graphs in general, this problem actually can be used to solve SAT. There is a way to take a three SAT formula and make some kind of very clever directed graph. There's a Hamiltonian path in a directed graph if and only if you can satisfy this reset formula, okay? So what's kind of going on here is that, you know, something like subset sum or, or longest path in a graph, they don't necessarily look that much more complicated than, I don't know, computing edit distance or shortest path in a graph on the surface of it, right? But somehow uh, those graphs can capture sat and shortest paths apparently cannot. Or if you could use shortest path to solve sat, that would be fantastic. You would definitely get an A in this class, um, but we don't we don't have that. So somehow, you know, we have all these uh, similar looking problems that can have very different behaviors, and we're sort of exploring, you know, why at a high level. All right, so we'll we'll do more of that kind of stuff today. So the main problem we'll focus on today is called independent set. Well, well, or maximum weight independent set. You can also look at the unweighted problem. The input is just an undirected graph. No edge weights, no vertex, well, with vertex weights, for example. In the simplest case, all the vertices have weight one, but maybe some weight more than others. A subset of vertices is independent if there's no edge in between any two of those vertices. Okay, so up there, the, the vertices that are in purple the bigger ones. That forms an independent set. So if you look, there's no edge between any two of them, whether it's in general edges between lots of other vertices. Other vertices. So that would be an independent set of cardinality five. Um, can you do better? Is it possible to get six? Anyone find a six? Oh, you got one? Okay. No, no. False six. All right. I, I don't know if it's possible. I mean, I haven't really. Uh... Okay. Anyway, so maybe that's the solution. Maybe the maximum cardinality independent set is size five. Uh, more generally, I can put weights on the vertices and ask for the maximum weight independent set. Slightly more general problem. Okay, so yeah, the goal is, uh, you know, you take a graph and you find 
the largest size of any independent set. Again, a very simple sounding problem, a very simple definition, you know, nothing uh, at the moment it's too complicated about it. Now, we're going to look at this problem both in, in undirected graphs in general, but we'll also look at special cases. And that's part of the, the theme of today's class, understanding general graphs versus some special cases. So, all right, so what are some of these special cases? We're going to look at two. The first one is what are called interval graphs. So your input is a set of intervals on the real line. Okay, so each of those things are supposed to be a colorful interval. And so you can think of this as a graph where you think of each interval as a vertex and you draw an edge if the, if the intervals overlap. So this is often done, for example, in like scheduling problems where each interval represents some time, right? And you can only schedule one thing at a certain point in time. So you think of these as, as vertices and you draw edges when they overlap. Uh, I'll draw it in blue. All right, so there's an edge, there's an edge, 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 uh, stuff like that. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing a bunch. Okay, but you get the idea. So an independent set of intervals maps to a, a non-overlapping set of intervals, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, so exactly. So intervals define a special case of graphs. Other direction. Can you take any graph and turn it into a set of intervals? Well, the answer is definitely no, but I'm trying to think of a nice uh, example. Can anyone think of a graph that can't be turned into an interval graph? I can actually think of one, but I'm going to give you guys a chance. Can you think of a, a relatively simple, small, undirected graph that cannot be turned into an interval graph? Oh, wait, does my example work? Uh, a triangle is okay, because that's just three intervals on top of each other. Oh, a square was only one diagonal. Okay. Um, yeah, one sec. Let me draw this somewhere that I need that. Okay. Okay, so if these are all intervals, uh, right? Okay, yeah, how did you argue that it's impossible? Okay, so let's call this A, B, C, and D. Yeah, okay, so A and C shouldn't overlap, so it should look like that. Yeah. Okay, so B overlaps is everything. D overlaps is everything. Yeah. Oh, just a square. Okay, so I get rid of this. Okay. Okay, if I just did a square, so I take out the diagonal now. A and C are like disjoint, so I've drawn them disjoint. And I'll, I'll draw B first. I know that B has to overlap both, so it has to look something like this. You could have switched the order of A and C, but the point is B has to be in the middle and has to straddle both. And now somehow I need to draw D so that it doesn't overlap B, but it overlaps A and C. But I know that D is already overlapping these 
inner endpoints of A and C, so that's going to be impossible. Unless the world was a circle, and then you can go, okay. <laughs> but no, on the real line, you can't, uh, okay. All right, good, good, good. Okay, so square, you cannot, uh, cannot be in intervals. All right, so I guess by that logic, I think any long cycle, any big cycle uh, is going to be problematic. Okay, so good, excellent, proud of you guys. All right, okay, so that's uh, that's our first first special case we'll look at, which is uh, graphs induced by intervals, and we can do weighted independent set where the intervals have weights. Okay. Uh, the second special case we'll look at is uh, what's formerly known as trees. So, um, oh, this is all sorts of screwed up, I see. Okay, uh, but, uh, you know, a special case of graphs is trees where there's no cycles. And so we'll also look at uh, whether the problem is hard or has an algorithm on trees. All right, those are the three things we'll look at, general graphs, interval graphs, trees, okay, and see what we learn. Okay, well, this is my favorite part of the class. By forcing you guys to participate, it gives me the impression that I'm teaching. All right, so the votes are, um, we have this problem in three different settings, graphs, intervals, and trees. And for each of them, it could turn out to be tough, hard as sat, or maybe we'll come up with an algorithm. Okay. Or you're allowed to not vote, as usual. But who's not gonna vote? I don't believe you, but that apparently is zero. All right, you're all obliged to vote. On graphs, who, think the, who thinks the problem will be difficult in the same way that sad is difficult? Oh. Okay. I like how like of the people who didn't vote, like three of them have their arms crossed like. That's not just a no, that's like a hell no. Okay, and then who thinks there'll be an algorithm? Okay, I really think everyone just about voted. Okay, all right, okay. Intervals, who thinks that intervals will turn out to be challenging and difficult like that? A delayed vote, but still we got some. Yeah, I'd say that's like 20%. All right, who thinks we're gonna be able to do an algorithm for intervals? Oh, okay. All right. Okay, last case is trees. Who thinks that trees will be tough, hard as sat? Okay. And who thinks that for trees, we'll get an algorithm? Wow, okay, everyone is. I think by now people who don't want to vote aren't coming. All right, I didn't know they'll have to vote. Okay, so uh, this is also at least consistent because uh, there's no way that intervals can be harder than grass because intervals are a special case of grass. There's no way that trees can be harder than sat because trees are a special case of or trees, your trees are harder than grass because trees are a special case of grass. So at least we're consistent in that regard, which we weren't last time. Okay. Um, sounds good. All right. So we'll start with, uh, with graphs. Uh, I'll start with, if any of the brave three who thought there might be an algorithm, does any of them have like an idea for an algorithm? You don't have to. Okay. No ideas. Um, fine. Well, okay. We are going to show that for a general graph, uh, even in the unweighted setting, trying to compute the maximum cardinality independence set is uh, at least as hard as that in the sense that an algorithm here gives an algorithm there. Okay, so. All right, so we're gonna do a, 
uh, we're going to start with just three sat and try to go from three sat over to over to independent sets. So somehow we're going to take as a input some kind of three sat formula f, and we're going to somehow produce some kind of graph, undirected graph. And we should be able to feed that into a black box that can solve the independent set problem. Maybe a decision black box where you say, uh, does this graph have an independent set of size k? You know, just a yes, no kind of black box. And we need to be able to, you know, digest that output and it needs to tell us something about the SAT formula. Okay, so that's gonna be the overall uh, layout um, of our proof. We'll start with three SAT and, and somehow we need to make a graph. Okay, so what do we need uh, from this graph? Somehow I need to take as input a formula F, which as usual has M clauses and N variables. And I need to turn it into a graph and somehow, whether or not F is satisfiable, it should have something to do with this maximum cardinality of the independent set of the graph. Okay, so as usual, of course, the, the answer is hiding on the next slide, but I like to ask you guys first for ideas, you know, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Or you probably could, but still, it's more fun to ask before, um, uh, you know, see what you guys come up with. So. It's sort of a, uh, this is not easy. It's not straightforward, at least as far as I can tell. But any ideas for somehow taking as input a formula and producing a graph? Yeah. Okay, so say I have a clause like that, that's also a vertex. So I guess I would connect Xi to the clause. Um, and then I would also have like an Xj and Xj bar. They're connected with an edge. And I would maybe clause attack the clause to Xj. And then uh, we can have something like that for Xk as well. Okay. All right, so... Uh, I think this is quite reasonable. Uh, for, for one, we're at least taking a formula and mapping it to a graph. That's a good start. Um, what was the logic or what was the reasoning behind adding an edge between Xi and Xi bar? Okay, okay. All right, so, so, okay, so independent set, right? Uh, in that problem, the edges represent constraints, right? Each edge between two vertices says you can only take one or the other. That's really all we have to work with. So when it comes to, to satisfiability, I know that for each variable, I can only set it to be true or false, right? So that, that's maybe why we add an edge here is that, you know, true or false, but not both, right? in a sense that you can take Xi and you can't take Xi bar or something like that, okay? And then, okay, so that, that represents some kind of contention, right? Now, the, the, next, the next suggestion was, all right, I'll put an edge between Xi uh, and C because if I take Xi, then I can't take C, okay? So, uh, which makes sense to me. Although compared to the other, the previous modeling, one thing may be a little bit different, somehow like, at least in my mind, taking Xi should be like good for C in some sense. Whereas here we've sort of drawn some opposition between Xi and C in, in some loose interpreted sense. That's a little different than, you know, Xi and Xi bar should definitely be opposed to each other. They should definitely be connected with an edge. Now I think, so I think this is a really good start, but I think that if you have enough clauses, which is usually the case, let's say there's more clauses than variables, isn't the solution always just to take all the clause vert vertices? 
Okay, so I think this gets us started, but it's not the whole thing. Uh, because here, uh, you know, we would have one vertex for every clause. I only drew one clause. But I think the solution would, you just take all the clauses as an independent set. So that's too, too big. Or at least that doesn't really tell us anything about satisfiability. Sorry? Well, if you if you add xi to your independent set, then you're not allowed to take the clause anymore because there's an edge between them. Well, maybe we don't. Uh, yeah, but that was just a suggestion to get us started. Um, so the, the ultimate construction will have edges between xi and xi bar that will survive. Wait, you want me to just draw it differently and put x? Oh, yeah, should the edge be like that? If you take x side, then you're still able to take c. Um, but okay, so let's say I drew those edges a little bit differently. So now I'm drawing a clause to the opposite literal instead of the, the same literal. Okay, now, well, okay, one thing that, that's going on is that, um, uh, let's take, I, I, I say, I take xk and xj bar or something, right? So the clause is satisfied if I take xi and I take xk, but just because I took xj bar, I'm no longer able to take the clause as well. You know, xj bar should have nothing to do with the clause. Yeah. Any other ideas? Yeah. Okay, well, we have to make the connections ahead of time because we prepare the graph and then the black box is going to try to find the maximum independent set somehow. This kind of thing. Okay, so what you're saying is that if I take xi, then I can't take xj bar. I mean, at some level, right? So why does that match the logic of the clause? So the clause is if you take xi, you don't have to take xj or xk. Whereas th these edges say, if you take xi, then you cannot take xj bar, which is sort of saying you have to take xj. A little different. These are all fun ideas. Any other ideas? Yeah. Okay, so all right, so okay, uh, I'm, okay, you said add edges between all pairs of, okay, so I, uh, I don't know if I've drawn all of them, but. Okay, so remove, okay, so which, okay, yeah, so walk through it slowly with me. So let's say you have a clause like xi, xj, xk. Okay, so I remove the edges between anyone in the clause and I leave all the other edges there. Which is still very similar to some other suggestion, right? Because the other suggestion was like, oh, add an edge from xi to xj bar and xi to xk bar. Those are the edges that are left after removing, if I'm not mistaken. I feel like you're just deleting, but arriving at the same set of edges as before, which is, if xi and xj both appear in a clause, then add an edge from xi to xj bar, and then add, add an edge from xj to xi bar. The sort of opposite ones. I feel like that's all that's left after deleting you know, xi and xj. 
Oh, I guess I guess you also have a okay. No, one difference is that you also have an edge between xi bar and xj bar, whereas the previous one didn't. Okay, so you have three more edges. Okay, so there's a slight difference, but um, the same uh, conceptual difficulty arises. There's still an x an edge between xi and xj bar. So that's sort of saying, if you take xi, you're not allowed to take xj bar, which is sort of saying you have to take xj, which seems a little bit different than what the clause is actually telling us. Any more suggestions? Otherwise. All right, I think you guys are ready. Um, okay, so, all right, so here's what, what we're gonna do. We're actually not gonna have vertices for clauses. What we're actually gonna do is like create little subgraphs corresponding to each clause. So here we're working with three sats, so every clause is only three variables. So for a clause like um, A or B or C bar, okay, we're, we're gonna make, instead of like um, one vertex for like every literal, we're gonna make one vertex for every appearance of every literal. So this clause A or B or C bar will generate three new vertices labeled A, B, and C bar. So there may be several vertices labeled A out there and several vertices labeled B out there. So we kind of have to remember which clause it's associated with, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw an edge first between all three of these, okay? So, so okay, so what does this do, right? So, all right, so this little subgraph, right? What's the maximum size of any independent set? of that triangle. One, if I take one corner, it touches the other two corners and, and you're done. So you can only get one point, which is sort of correct for sat. You only need to take one variable to satisfy it, right? So you can only get one point per clause, rats. Uh, okay, you can only get one point per clause. It's like choosing one of the corners, okay? And we'll, so we'll do that for all of the clauses. Okay, so that would be the clause for the other one, right? So at this stage, you have M clauses, and you'll make M triangles, and you have three M vertices. Okay, so the, there may be many vertices with the same label on it. Okay, so th the logic at this stage is that, you know, you choose one of those literals, like you set A to be true, and then you get one point for the left clause, right? Because you'll take that vertex, okay? But it's not done yet. We still need one more step, and here you guys might be able to guess. Ah, I should connect A and A bar, because if I take A, I can't take A bar. Okay, so, good. So we'll connect opposite, I mean, vertices whose labels correspond to opposite literals, because I can only take one or the other. Okay, so, and we'll do that for every clause and all the things. All right, so, help paint a picture. Here's a slightly more elaborate formula. So here we have uh, four clauses and I've already set up the initial triangles for each one. So the first clause ABC, that's the left triangle. The second clause BC bar D bar, that's the second triangle. Third one A bar C D, that's the third triangle. Fourth clause A B bar D bar, that's the fourth triangle. So that gives us, you know, at most one point for every clause. And now we need to start drawing all the edges. So you guys can tell me which ones I miss. I always miss a bunch. I do this every year, right? But here I'm connecting all the A's uh, and A bars to each other. I think that was all of them. Uh, for B, we have this and, oops. Right, and then for C, we have this, and we have this, and for D, uh, 
we have that. And we have that. All right, did I miss anything? Okay. All right, but you know, so in this way, I've connected all the the opposite literals to each other. This is the prettier one I did ahead of time. I don't know if it's much prettier, but anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so M clauses go to M triangles with three M total vertices. So the graph is still roughly the same size as the, the formula F that's important to check. Okay, um, does the construction make sense? Well, it's saying you can only take one. So even if you wanted to set, let's say you wanted to take A and B, right? You set A to be true and B to be true. So you can only choose one and get one point, but over here you can still take B and stuff like that. But maybe we should do a proof to double check because at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. So, all right, that's the construction. So the claim we want to show is that F is satisfiable if and only if there is an independent set of size M, which is corresponding to taking one vertex from every triangle. That's the best you can do because you can only get one point from every triangle. Okay, so I just wanna make sure we kind of, at least at a high level, go through each direction. And I probably won't write everything out because my handwriting is not great anyway, but hopefully it'll make sense. All right, so let's do, okay, so the two directions, right? F is satisfiable if and only if there's an independent size M. So we can start with the first direction. Suppose F is satisfiable. We want to show that that means that there's an independent set of size M. Okay, so how would I construct that independent set of size M? Yeah, so let's say, uh, let's say, you know, for each clause of the form. So I'm, I'm just, you know, going a little bit more slowly what I think you're getting at, you know, of the form A, B, U, C, A is some literal, it could be X, I or X, I bar. B is some literal, it could be X, J or X, J bar. Okay. Then what? Yeah. Yeah, so that means either A, B, or C is true. And maybe more than one, that's fine, right? And okay, so if A is true, then we should Yeah, take the vertex corresponding to the true literal, right? Okay, so so A, you say okay, that that gives m vertices right? One from each clause. So the, you know, we need to make sure that we're not taking two vertices from the same edge, right? We just need to double check. So, you know, the clause edges, so to speak, the triangle edges, the clause edges are okay because I'm only taking one from every clause, right? And now the, the only other kind of edge to check is the edges between like an XI and XI bar, and that's okay because Edges are okay because, I mean, this isn't very formally written, but, right? So those are the only other remaining edges to check, those purple edges, but the, why are they okay? Yeah, because we're working off of an assignment, right? Like, uh, like uh, we're, we're working off of either XI to be true or XI, yeah. 
you know, because uh, the assignment only takes one of these or something like that, you know. You'll write some awkward sentence, but I think the idea will be clear just, but the real thing is, uh, do I, did I really double check all the constraints in the independent set problem for us? We have just two types of edges, the edges from the clauses, those triangles and the edges between the opposite literals. We just have to double check. Oh yeah, those will be okay. Then we're done. All right, question, almost question, no. Okay, uh, opposite direction, got this wrong. Suppose there's an independent set of size M. Yeah. Can this also solve max reset? Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the number of vertices in your thing will correspond to the number of clauses you've satisfied. I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, now we just do the uh, the opposite direction, right? So suppose there's an independent set of size m. We, now we need to show that f is satisfiable, which means we should pull out a satisfying assignment. Uh, okay, so yeah, so let's just be uh, explicit. So for each xi, okay, for each xi, okay, so I think you're saying set xi equals true if we select an xi labeled vertex False, if we select an xi bar labeled vertex. Okay, but what if I select an xi and xi bar vertex? Ah, okay, so uh, You know, note that we can't have both. It's good to point out why we can't have both uh, because of the xi, xi bar edges. Okay, good. So now the assignment is clear. Uh, wait, what if neither is selected? What happens if I don't check any, select any vertices correspond to Xi, neither the Xi or the Xi bar vertices? Okay, otherwise, otherwise, uh, either, or you can just say set Xi to be true and make it. Okay, so if it, if it wasn't, okay, so just be thorough. And now we just have to argue, okay, so now the assignment is well-defined, right? We know what we're talking about. And why does it satisfy the formula? Yeah, so how do I know I satisfy all the triangles? Yeah, there's like a pigeonhole thing going on here. There's uh, M triangles, and each you can only get one vertex out of it. So if you get M, you're getting exactly one from every single one. And so for each clause, that selected vertex will satisfy the clause. Okay, and you just write that out, but I've run out of room. Okay, all right, it'll be like two sentences. Okay, but in that way, we've kind of slowly gone in both directions. I start with a satisfying formula, I explain my independent set, I double check that it's actually an independent set and it has a certain size. Conversely, if you give me the independent set of size M, I first construct a satisfying assignment, or I mean, construct a, an assignment at all, the xi and xi bars explain why it works. You know, the fact that you have the edges between the xi's and xi bars is important. Otherwise we wouldn't have put it in the construction. And then we, um, 
explain why all the clauses are satisfied. And it should take into account why we have edges for those triangles, those triangular edges. Okay. So you just go through both, both directions. By the time you've done this kind of, once you've come up with the construction correctly, there's probably not too many surprises in the proof part because you're just going through your thinking. So you probably just find it annoying, but since I can't read your mind, you still got to do it. Okay. All right. There's plenty of people who will get any particular problem wrong that obviously I do have to ask. Okay. So, uh, you know, just write it. I feel your pain because I write the solutions for homeworks. Okay. Um, okay. So that's, that's, that's the, the construction and the proof and all that. You know, we, we create this uh, clever graph with these triangular gadgets to represent the clauses and edges uh, between opposing literals. So it wasn't so far off from the initial suggestion. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we're making great time. All right. Okay, so graphs turned out to be hard. Turns out you can you can plant the three sat problem with a bunch of triangles. Okay. Um, so for intervals, I think what was what did we do? All right. So for intervals, eighty percent of you thought there would be an algorithm, and twenty percent thought it would turn out to be hard. Uh, to entertain myself, I'm going to make you guys vote again. Okay. Who's not voting? Okay, trust you. All right, second round. Who thinks that intervals will turn out to be hard? Seems like fewer people this time. One, two, three, four, five. All right, we're down to like 7% or something. Okay, and then now who thinks we're gonna get an algorithm? Okay, all right. So for those of you who, especially, you know, who are more emboldened now, or why, 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 especially any of you who flipped votes, why do you think we'll get an algorithm now if you didn't think we would have gotten one earlier? Maybe another question is, we just showed that the graph problem is hard, why didn't more of you think the intervals would be hard? Why why would proving something hard make you feel better about Or are you just assume me I'm going to zigzag every lecture? Yeah. Okay, so this is this is a very good point, right? So so intervals are somewhat restricted. For example, we can't express squares, right? So it is a restriction. And when we do these, you know, eccentric, you know, gadgety wild graphs, right? I mean, I don't know if this is a very natural graph. This isn't gonna come up out of a uh, I don't know if you're working on maps or something, it doesn't look like a map of anything, right? All these crazy gadgety graphs, they're not very natural. So, so maybe, you know, we won't be able to use these tricks if we're restricted to intervals, right? That's, that's an important thought, right? And, you know, so at some level, this is a question of, so with very little structure, with just a general graph, the problem is hard. Right, with no restriction, I can capture sad because I can make triangles and hook them up in funny ways and it's a wild and crazy, really well-connected graph. Um, but you know, the point is that it can express you know, complicated logic. But when I start imposing structure and saying, oh, this graph is, comes from intervals. Oh, this graph is a tree or something. Is that enough structure to exclude these you know, reductions or, or not? Right, so is our intervals restrictive enough to to stop us from from showing it's hard, um, which also means that do they have enough structure to allow us to come up with an algorithm? So it's really a question about the structure 
of the underlying graph. Okay. All right, so most of you thought there might be an algorithm. So who wants to then suggest an algorithm? So here I've added some arbitrary weights to the intervals, that's the numbers. Okay, you want to get the maximum weight independent set, that means the maximum weight set of non-overlapping intervals. Any ideas? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's take it slowly. Let's uh let's start with a recursive spec. Right? So maybe like uh you know, if I said like I don't know, for uh for a family of weighted intervals. So we'll eventually get to your full suggestion, uh, but work with me. Uh, intervals, I don't know, bold faced I, okay. I'll, I'll write uh, M W I S of I is uh, the maximum weight independent set for this set of intervals. So I think I've already gotten it written. Uh, here, okay, so, right, so for, uh, this is a reasonable place to get started. Uh, it takes as input a uh, family of weight intervals and outputs the weight of the maximum weight independent set, right? It's basically restating the question. Okay, so if we try to implement this recursive spec, right, uh, how might I go about it? Just want to implement it recursively. Uh, what? Oh, well, okay. So we might not get a very fast algorithm initially. We will actually pursue your idea momentarily, but, but work with me because I have some slides set up. So if I want to just naively or kind of straightforward, you know, implement this recursively, you know, I just take as a, a set of, of intervals. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm starting to see your idea. So I think you guys are all actually working a little faster than expected. So let me go a little quicker than through this part. So let me first uh, go through what would first be a, a naive implementation relatively. This won't be fast and we'll, we'll discuss why and then we'll discuss how to make it faster and that's where you guys can guess. All right, so here's maybe a naive implementation. Uh, I first check, oh, is there any intervals left? If there's no intervals left, I return zero. That's the base case, right? Otherwise, um, I pick any interval you know, maybe I, I just, I'm going to test out uh, this teal interval of size two, and I either take it or I don't, right? So if I don't take it, I'll just delete it and I'll recurse on everything else. If I do take it, then, um, you know, I'll figure out what are the, all the intervals that I don't conflict with. So I wrote I prime or bold faced I prime for intervals that are not disjoint with that interval I'm trying out. And I say, okay. I'll take it, I'll get the weight of I, and I'll add whatever's the best thing of the remaining 
intervals. Okay, so this is a, a relatively unstructured, kind of straightforward recursion. No cleverness yes, yet. The suggestions were already better than what has come at this stage. Um, okay, but now what's the running time? You know, it's this kind of brute force kind of thing. I start with n intervals. I recurse on two subproblems of size n minus one. So you get this two to the n kind of thing. Okay. All right. So here then is the question that I think you guys were all alluding to, but now I'm going to kind of try to bring into sharp focus. So we are going to kind of work with this naive algorithm at a high level. I think what we we'll eventually do will kind of be like still within this framework. But I want to take this and now make it fast, right? I want to figure out, you know, the, the, the algorithm itself is kind of obviously correct in terms of getting the right answer. So just trying everything basically. I mean, we can do it induction proof. It won't be so hard. But, you know, what's, what am I missing? How do I make this faster concretely? There's a precise answer to this. Uh, so even with, oh, here I think I assumed, uh, oh, okay, suppose I just added caching, right? So I saved the sub problems and stuff like that. So what's the issue? Why, how come, how come dynamic program doesn't save us? Yeah, so how many sub problems are there? This algorithm is basically enumerating all possible subsets of intervals, or at least it could in the worst case. So you're still looking at like two to the n sub problems or something like that, which is the same running time. So saving, you're actually not saving by, saving answers doesn't buy much yet. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let me maybe rephrase this question. Like step two, I choose some interval, right? Which interval should I choose? The last one or the first one? So if I choose the first interval, right? Uh, which is this maroon two. I could have put a five there and then that would have been the peak of my teaching, but anyway. Okay, so um, I either include maroon two or I don't, right? So if I include maroon two, then I would erase everything overlapping with it. And in the sub problem, I also won't look at maroon two, right? So it looks something like this. But in particular, it's, uh, it's, all, the, it's all the problems that, all the intervals that start after the right endpoint of maroon two. Okay, and so for any of these intervals, when I'm testing it, I'm only going to look at the remaining intervals after the right endpoint of some interval, if I'm always doing the leftmost. So some of if I'm always doing the leftmost interval, you won't actually be trying all subsets. You only, your subproblems will always be defined by, oh, here's the last interval I looked at, what's the rightmost, or something like that. Okay, so... That's sort of a high level idea. At some level, there's an even more clever, concise kind of algorithmic. What would I do algorithmically? I could write let i be the leftmost interval. But there's something you can do that's like a little bit more, it's just better, uh, but roughly the same idea. No, that, that I agree with, that I, I agree with. But then the subproblem will still be looking at like an awkward subset of intervals. Uh, like if you actually coded this, what might you do? I'm not sure if my question makes sense, but. No, I agree with the, mm -hmm. okay, here. This is what we're gonna do. So this is roughly the same idea, but it's gonna even sharpen it a little bit more. As a preliminary step, 
we'll sort the intervals by left endpoint. Okay, so we'll sort the intervals by left endpoint. So that's what I've done here. I've numbered the vertices one, two, three, four, five, six in black, just based on whose left endpoint comes first. Okay, and this is going to help us organize our subproblems much better. And it's going to actually, I think, just much more concisely express what we've all been saying. Okay, so, all right, so if I've numbered the intervals one through n, right, and I revisit my recursive spec, uh, and now I have a little more notation at my disposal, what might you guys write? Yeah. Okay, so maybe current one is represented by some index k and uh, the maximally independent subset of ik through in, something like that. So we're always looking at a suffix of the list, right? And what this also does is it makes really, really clear that we only have n subproblems now. Before we could kind of believe it if we had always picked the left interval first, that there's a little structure maybe coming out of it or something. But now with the ordering and, and the list, we can act, we know exactly what the subproblems look like. It's much easier to make that argument. Okay, so that's a recursive spec. Uh, how would I implement it? What should I write? Yeah, I think they're weighted, but I'll write the weight of I n. Fine. All right, what about Caleb? Yeah, otherwise. Let's say you're looking at the teal two again. Yeah, so a little bit careful. So if I do, so okay, we're just going to the same logic. I either take the interval or I don't. If I don't take it, I just go to the next interval. I'll be interval number eight in this case, if I'm looking at interval seven. If I do take seven, then I need to go and find the first interval that comes after the first interval that comes after the interval I'm looking at, interval number seven, in that case, that's number 10, right? So I need to scan and find the next one. So that's a little awkward, so. All right, so if k is bigger than n, we return zero. Otherwise, uh, I'm letting L be the index of the first interval that comes after the right endpoint of ik, which is, let's say, n plus one if there is no interval. Right, it'll be bigger than n if there is no interval. And I either don't take it and I just look at the start looking at the k plus one interval, or I do take it and then I find the maximum weight starting from i sub l. Okay. All right, so that's the algorithm. And then we'll we'll apply caching and dynamic programming and save the answers. What will be a running time of our algorithm? N squared, why? Yeah, I also note we sorted originally, so there's an N log N term, but that's at this point not important. Okay, so you spend N time because you have to search for L, right? You're at K and you need to find the first index that comes after. All right, so that gives uh, N squared. Anyone do better? We've already applied the dynamic programming caching. Anyone want to improve the n squared time? In particular, can we find L faster? 
Sorry? A heap. You want to put everything in a heap? Yeah. Uh, binary search. In fact, all the intervals are already sorted by left endpoint. And I just need to find the first one that comes after whatever the right endpoint is. So we can do binary search, right? The over under game. And only spend log n time finding the next interval. Okay, so uh, we apply binary search. And the running time becomes, well, you have to spend n log n time to sort at the beginning. That actually is mildly relevant now. And after that, you have uh, n sub problems and log n time per sub problem. Okay, so all together, you get an n log n running time. So this is kind of rare for us. Sometimes you can improve your dynamic programming implementation a little bit by inserting a binary search or data structure here and there. Um, so just something to keep an eye out for. Like if that came up in a, in a problem in the rubric, that might be worth like an extra, you know, one last point or two. If you're like missing that speed up, you still get most of the points, but okay. All right, any questions? Okay. Last one, no time to vote. Well, maybe there's always time to vote. But no time to vote for abstaining people. All right, last one is trees. Okay, I wanna know if maximum weight independent set's gonna be hard in trees. Okay, does anyone think it'll turn out to be hard? One. Okay. Anyone think we'll get an algorithm? Okay. A few liars. Okay. Slash busy people. All right. So, um, okay. Uh, why do you think it's going to be hard? Not to put you on the spot, but you're the only one who voted. Okay. Just guess. I think that's fine. Um, I guess the, on a test, you even have, I don't know as an option. All right, algorithm. Why did you guys think there might be an algorithm? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay, one can certainly hope that it's restrictive enough. Okay. All right, so, okay. Now, any ideas for an algorithm? Yeah. Uh, so it's sometimes called a leaf because we're really into our tree metaphors. Okay, so I can either take it or I or I don't, right? And there's the only reason not to take it if I'm going to take the next one. Otherwise, I would have. Is that true? Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, okay. Right, I can try to work at the leaves and moving in. Is there any way to argue? So I can do a recursive algorithm where I take a leaf and I either take it or I don't into one plus or not one plus. So I guess my question is, is there any way to argue that we get a small number of subproblems this way? So I think that kind of brings to the big kind of conceptual question. So we are gonna come up with an algorithm. It's gonna be a relatively simple recursive algorithm. But we need a little more insight, right? I give a tree like this, right? And like, for example, before it was brought up like, oh, whenever we do dynamic programming, we usually have some sense of sequence, right? There was some structure from left to right that made the recursion fast. Same was also stuff on DAGs, you have the topological order. But with trees, it's not so clear. I can combine a whole branch into what? Oh, 
Well, okay, sure. Yeah, this is not a very exciting tree. So on a path, yeah, there's not many choices. But imagine I drew, okay, I drew a more complicated tree. Okay, so, okay, yeah. We say, yeah, okay, even if you got rid of paths, you're gonna be left with a tree without long paths, right? You're gonna have to eventually come up with some ideas. Start with the root node. Well, what's the root? Okay, so I think you're saying that if the tree was like rooted, if it looked like this, right? Then we sort of have a, a top-down structure because uh, you know I can look at the root and I have subproblems given by subtrees, right? And those don't interact with each other because they're separated subtrees. So I can maybe recurse on both and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, so subtrees, like the word sub, if you're looking for sub problems, just you know, add the prefix sub and see how far that gets you. Probably for most problems it works in this class. Okay, subsequence, subgraph, uh, subtree. Okay, subset of intervals. Now, but our my but the tree I give you is not rooted. Okay, so how do how do I find a root? Okay, we can just pick a root. I'll pick that one, right? Chosen arbitrarily. And now what can I do? Um, okay, so what do I wanna do? All right, I can rip that subtree. That's not what I wanted. Uh, okay, give me a sec. All right, so. I can uh, rip this off here. Well, where'd it go? Right, there's my root. Something wrong happened. I'll figure that out later. Right, and this could sort of be a, a subtree or something, right? Whatever, uh, I chose the wrong root. Sometimes I do it better and it's more convincing. But the point is that I choose any root, right? And now automatically pushes everything else down and suddenly you have the structure you wanted. So you can pick any root arbitrarily. You could even pick the leaf after all, okay? So that's it. Uh, if you have done it better, you have done it. You know, we just pick a root and now you have subtrees, okay? Now you have some structure you can work with. Now recursion might make some sense, okay? All right, so if we made a recursive algorithm, a natural thing is to write, okay, uh, I'll define the subproblems by subtrees. I'll define uh, for vertex V, uh, MWIS stands for maximum weight independent set. I got tired of writing it. MWIS of V is the maximum weight of any independent set in the subtree rooted at V. Right now that we have a fixed a global root, now I have subtrees, but I pick a vertex or stuff underneath it. That's the subtree, right? Okay. So if I tried to implement this, right? I have a vertex V, it has some subtrees, right? All right, what might I do? At least at a high level. So we either choose the root or we don't. So we want to do the max, so so be some max of some choices. So if I don't choose it, I'll sum over, I don't know, all the children, the children X of V. So that's all the subtrees. And I'll compute the maximum weight independent set of X, right? So X is the root of one of these subtrees. So that's one choice. Now, if I do take V, how would I express that? So first I would get the weight of V. Right, and then yeah. So I can't choose any of those x's anymore. 
right? So I might be tempted to write something like this, child x, mwis of x, uh, but I'm not actually allowed to choose x anymore, right? So this recursive subcall may be tempted to choose x, uh, which is not allowed. Subtrees of subtrees. Okay, so there will be some kind of like grandchildren. Okay, so, okay. So there, I think there's two things. One, the code's getting a little bit complicated. If you actually wrote the loops, right, you have to go there and, and down again. And two, you, well, code actually won't come out as fast as what we'll eventually get. Okay, so one idea is to try to write something complicated that went down to the grand, grandchildren level. Is there anyone here that's lazier than that? Yeah. Starting at the root, you either take the root and then do every third grandchild. Um, that's not no, that's not lazier. I'm looking for something really easy. Yeah. I'm looking for something even simpler. Yeah. In the interest of time, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Uh, no, something simpler. Yeah. Subtract the weight of the tree. The what? Sorry, one more time. Oh, oh, set the children's weight to zero. Oh, that's not unclever. That's, but. That gets a little bit weird because now the sub problems get a little funky. Yeah. All right, so this is a great thing about recursion, right? You want something, you just ask for it, right? If you want the maximum weight independent set that doesn't include the root, just ask for the maximum weight independent set that doesn't include the root and it will be given to you, okay? So this is all we're gonna do. All right, I'm just adding, I'm extending the sentence. I've added a flag that I call exclude root. If that flag is true, I want the maximum weight independent set among all of those that don't include the root. If it's false, it's allowed to include the root. Okay, I think conceptually that's very simple, right? Maybe it's a little verbose because I chose a long name for the variable, but it's very simple, right? And now if I just wanted to implement this, sorry, in the interest of time, Right, I have it prepped. So if exclude root is true, so I'm not allowed to use the root, then I'm just gonna sum up uh, MWIS X false over all children X of V. So false is saying you're not allowed, to, you're, you are now allowed to use the root for those children, right? Because you didn't take V, so you're allowed to take X's, right? If exclude root is false, then I have two choices. One is that I don't take the root. The easiest way to do that is just to call MWIS V true, because that won't take the root. Or I take V and for all the children, I just put true in that exclude root parameter. So I'm not allowed to take the children. Okay, so it's very uh, uh, simple. Add a flag, implement it, right? Now that your, your algorithm does more, um, it's actually easier to implement the whole thing. This is easier, I think, than going through grandchildren also. Plus, going through grandchildren, you're gonna kind of double the look at edges and it can actually get kind of slow if you're not very careful, so. Okay, um, very briefly, what would be the running time of this algorithm? I know we're a little over time, this is the last thing. So for a particular vertex V, how much time do I spend? Well, there is a loop in here. So I'll take time proportional to the number of children of V, right? So the running time is gonna look like, oh, summing over V, the number of children of V. 
If I sum up the number of children over all the vertices, what do I get? Number of edges. I end up just counting every edge once, right? It's big O of M. How many edges are in a tree? N. Okay. So this will actually be very fast. Okay, so I think uh, the, the main takeaway is that is really to look at the structure of graphs, right? Completely unstructured, we can't do anything with independent set. I look at special cases like intervals, then you can order by left endpoint, that gives you enough structure. With trees, you root it, you have subtrees, now you have enough structure to make a nice, fast algorithm. Okay, all right, thank you.